Jean-Pierre has been involved with uh, African, Economic, African School of Economics uh, uh, predecessor, the Institute for Metro Research in Political Economy, uh, <coughs> where he came to, to teach in 2006. Uh, yeah, 2006, to teach game theory uh, for us. His picture is still featured on, uh, on uh, pre permanently on, on the website of your um, so Jean-Pierre uh, got his PhD from Stanford University, taught at Columbia and uh, New York University, and then and now uh, the London Business School. Uh, you know, he's a one of the premier theorists in game theory, law economics, political economy, and uh, so. But well, more recently, he has been working in behavioral economics. Um, and then that's going to be uh, more or less the theme of uh, the presentation. And as I said yesterday, uh, we, we hope that the presentation, for instance, what we get from it, is something that you will find extremely useful for your own research and, and also for those of you who want to pursue a PhD later on, uh, we hope it's going to be an inspiration for uh, you know, for what wants to do, not only at the clinical level, but also uh, an application. And then I know from here, Jean-Pierre is going to be teaching at Columbia University, uh, uh, starting, I think, Monday, I believe. Yeah, Wednesday. Wednesday, I believe, yeah. And I cannot be more grateful to, to see that he was able to squeeze uh, a couple of days in, because, I mean, London to New York, I think, <laughs> is a direct flight. A direct flight, 20 times a day. You know. So coming to Benin with all you know, the logistics issues, going back, before going back to New York, to teach uh, next week, it shows how yeah, really committed uh, he is uh, to help initiatives like ours you know, to prosper. So we are extremely grateful to have him here. And without further ado, uh, <laughs> years ago, so I'm glad to see the, the progress you made in the university. And already then it was very exciting, yeah. and there were some very good students, and I'm sure there's some very good students here too. <laughs> Today's top, uh, lecture topic is topics in theory, and I heard people mention, I see there's some hardcore theorists here, but nonetheless, I want to ask a general question is, do we really need theory at all? Of course, since I do theory, the answer will be yes. <laughs> but still, let's step back and ask, why do we need theory? Now we're in a big data kind of uh, era now. Can we just look at the data? Can we just look at experiments? Do I have to bother with this formal theorizing at all? And I'm going to ask that broad question, but I'll answer it by looking at some specific examples, depending on how much time we have. Question here will be, what is the role <coughs> of theory in explaining experiments? Okay, look at the behavior of experiments. So I'm just going to start with the experiment, which is very, very well known. Uh, experiment by Spencer. And what Spencer was interested in, the question is, do people understand themselves? Okay, do you have a good conception of yourself? How skillful you are? What implications will that have for your risk-taking behavior, for your behavior in general? And as you know, uh, you started economics 30 years ago, you would have a very uh, narrow conception of a person as being very rational, doing a lot of calculations in a very logical way, not emotional, not being thrown off, not making simple errors. And now we're maybe in an opposite kind of era, where behavioral, so-called behavioral critique has come to, uh, to the fore. So, well, let's look a little bit more carefully at how people behave. And let's look at what psychologists have to say, or at least at what economists think psychologists have to say, uh, and maybe do our own experiments. So Spencer was interested in this question, and he answered it in particular by saying, well, let me look at driving. Well, not that I'm you know, necessarily interested in driving, but people drive a lot. They have a lot of experience uh, in their driving. And let's see if they understand <coughs> how well they drive. Are they skillful drivers? Are they safe drivers? So he gathered people in a room, just like we do today. And then he asked them, oh, look around. And tell me, compared to everyone else in this room, how skillful a driver are you? And then he asked them to rank themselves. Compared to other people, are you more 
skill, less skill, top 20%, top 30%, bottom 10%. And what did he find? That a majority of the people said they were more skilled than the average driver in each group. So he went there and he actually did it in Sweden and the United States, and something like 77% of Swedes said they were more skillful than the average driver. And 85% of Americans, we'll see the exact data. I will remember exact data. That's the question. That's what we found. And again, the question will be okay, that's good. Do I need any theory to go with that? Does it just speak for itself? This finding is usually summarized by saying people are overconfident. And here we have three quotes. Tendency to evaluate self, oneself more favorably than others is a staple finding in social psychology. Does it? The studies have shown there. Here we have the bond that recent Nobel Prize winner Thaler saying perhaps it's the most robust finding in the psychology of judgment that people are overcome. And of course, that will have implications for economists because we might, well, we'll see. We'll see. First thing I want to say, even though this is not necessarily uh, my topic. But let's just be careful. For some reason, this is the way economists always summarize uh, uh, evidence by saying there's overwhelming evidence that people are overcome. Actually, the evidence is not quite that. It, it's more mixed. And if you ask psychologists, that's not what they would say. That, they would say that's a kind of out-of-date summary. They would say that their people tend to be overconfident in an easy domain, such as driving. If I ask people how well you drive, most people will say better than average. But then if I ask people how well are you, do you, are you on a unicycle? Or how well do you jump? Things which seem difficult, most people will say they're worse than average. There seems to be overcome, underconfidence in that domain. Just for your information, I'll tell you that. And I'll also point out that this tends to happen mostly in domains where you don't have an objective measure. So if I ask, how fast do you run? It was very objective how fast you run. You'll tend to find people have a pretty good estimate of how fast they run. If you take a room when you say, how fast are you faster than the average person or not, you'll have about 50% of the people saying they're fast. There's overconfidence, underconfidence, sometimes neither, at least apparently from what the data is telling us. Economists tend to summarize the overconfidence, and that's most of the literature has written in that direction, so we'll kind of emphasize that one as well. Let me also, just in the interest of having you just know the literature a little bit better, say although often it's said people are overconfident, if you look more closely, there are three types of experiments around overconfidence. One finds overestimation. Overestimation is I asked how good are you in an absolute sense? And then you say you're better than you are. That would be called overestimation. I give you a little test now, and I say out of 20, how many questions do you think you answered correctly? And you answer 14, but you say 17. You're overestimating how many you are. Over precision is I ask for a confidence. I ask you, how many people in Benin do you think have a mobile telephone? And then I say, give me 90% confidence in it. And I ask a bunch of questions like that. How about in London? How about in Google? And I ask for a 90% confidence interval, and people tend to make those intervals too now. They're, they think they're more precise than they are. And the final kind, which is what we'll talk about today, and which Spencer talked about, is overplacement. That's where I ask you to place yourself relative to others. And then we see, for instance, too many people saying they're above average. But what is too many? More than 50%. If you have any questions, feel free to stop me. So why do we care? So what difference does it make for people who are There are lots of reasons. So economists care because 
maybe too many people might open a restaurant or go into business. Or if I give a farmer advice on doing something, the farmer says, ah, that's all right, I know. I don't really need to listen to you. So you're not as good as you think you are. It's going to throw us off. Maybe you're looking for a job, and then you keep turning down offers, and you say, well, I'm better than that. I'll get a better job offer. And then we have unemployment as a result of that. That would be an explanation. You might ask, oh, why are so many people unemployed? Oh, the fear of this world now. Maybe. The indirect reason is this behavioral critique of my mission, which is I go back years, and the economists just said, oh, people are perfectly rational. They're narrowly really self-interested. You know, that's actually not quite true. But as a working socialist, they said that. And we were scored with that. We're very happy to say that. And say, you know what? If you say that they're not rational, it's going to be too difficult. I don't know what to do. That's the way I want to model people. It's very useful. And then behavioral critique says, oh, no, actually, you should take very seriously that they're bound to rational, and they feel anxious, and then they get mad, and they can't do calculations and they make this mistake, that mistake, that mistake. And here's another mistake that they make. That they are misconfident, we see. Either overconfident or underconfident, but in any case, it's not the right level of confidence. What I'm going to talk about first is based on a paper I wrote called The Parent Overconfidence <coughs> with my co-author, Juan. When I say Spencer found that 77% of people said they were a uh, better driver than the average, that kind of finding is summarized as better than average effect. I asked, how intelligent are you compared to other people? Okay. More intelligent than the average, less intelligent than the average, and most people say more intelligent. How friendly are you in high school? How friendly are you compared to other as a business manager, are you better? How good a lecturer are you as a professor? That's better than average.
I mean, I just, it's, it's a bit of a red herring. It's a bit of a red herring if you do your experiment correctly. So it's something that you need to take care of. But people have taken care of it. And there are two kinds of experiments in this domain. The ranking experiment, which is what I'm talking about here, rank yourself. And another scale experiment, which is, says put yourself exactly somewhere. And then asks, uh, what's that happen? We're talking about ranking experiments here. So Svensson asked people to rank themselves and found 77% of the Swedish drivers, of the world. So the Swedish drivers he asked followed the university setting. Another issue, just to keep in the back of your mind for experiments, a lot of them are done with uh, college students. And you might ask yourself how well that is. 77% of drivers felt they were better than the median and the U.S. 80%. That's the better than average effect. Now, here's my question. I don't know if you read Spencer's paper, but you know, summarize it. He gave, he gave that experiment. I'll give you the exact questions that he asked. He came up with the young. Uh, I said, okay, people are judging themselves correct. So my question for you is, does he have a theory or any kind of formal model at all? Well, maybe you haven't read the paper. But if you haven't read the paper, we can ask the follow-up question. Well, does it matter? So when I give that result to you, I say 77% of Swedes said they were better than average. Do you think, oh my gosh, where's the theory? What's the model? start to write down something carefully, or you just go, well, wow, that's really interesting. People are overconfident. <coughs> Does it need a theory? Do we really need theory at all? Does that just speak for itself? 77% of the average people are overconfident. Oh, the only question that might come to mind is, did you find average properly? Did you do a statistical test properly? You know, did you incentivize them properly? Like experimentalist type questions. But you really need to go to the theorists and say, well, wait a second, where's the model? So if you're studying uh, economics, well, it depends on the kind. Largely, even what an economist might not call very <laughs> theoretical, someone else might call still pretty model driven. What's the matter? Does it need a theory? Is there anything in what I said, actually, which suggests uh, something like a theory, a proposition, or anything? Or is it just fun? Well, let me go on. We'll be a little bit more specific. Well, here's a proposition in there. Uh, which says, okay, you found the better than average effect. I guess you're telling me the better than average effect implies people don't have correct beliefs. Or you're telling me the better than average effect implies people are overconfident. If I just wanted to be a little bit nerdy about it and precise and say, oh, well, let me at least write it in the way an economist might write it, as opposed to a psychologist. Let me start by saying, proposition, better than average effect implies this, or this, some variation on that. And I'm done. So let me write that, and if I'm going to write that, then I have to ask myself, well, why? If I'm going to write the proposition, I have to be able to then prove the proposition. Or at least argue. So if you read papers on the better than average effect, and you go back 10 years, let's say, or 20 years, uh, most of them will just say better than average effect, therefore people are overconfident. They won't tell you why. Well, why does the better than average effect imply people are overconfident? So why does it? If I just told if I said to you, oh yeah, that's very amusing. But now I just want you to write down, exactly, write down the proof. So there's your proposition. Now write down the proof. Better than average effect, applies to more confident, proof. So why would that imply that people are over time?
correct beliefs about themselves. Thank you. Let me just step back. You know, in, in a sense, the problems it looks too easy, too trivial. But let me nonetheless ask. Suppose I said 77% of people think they're uh, better drivers than average. And what does that make you think? Does that statement make you think people are overconfident? Okay, so why? Suppose you're explaining this to someone who you know, like, I don't, I don't understand, what are you telling me? So, so what? Insist on winning every time when you should win. Because you 
quite loose with it. But that's just to say, if I put down a queen and turn it over, the definition <coughs> I want doesn't really seem to be I'm overconfident because I thought I won and I didn't. I guess if I put down a six and you think you've won, you might say I'm overconfident. And if I put down a queen, you wouldn't. Here I'm being very picky in a sense. Well, maybe not in another sense. I'm saying, well, if I'm going to prove this, if I just look at that and I just say, and as I say, almost every paper just says better than average if that proves people are overconfident without adding anything. And then the ones that do add something will just say exactly what you said. This shows what we're covering. Because only half can be better. And then if I want to be picky about that, I'll say, well, I've got two problems. You've got to show me exactly what you meant by overconfident. First, define that. And then there's this little slip. Because it doesn't seem like what you want to be saying is because it turns out a lot. But that somehow what I thought wasn't right. And now if I want to say, well, more than half can't think they're better than average. Well, you know what? Now I'm going to have to define, well, what does it mean to think I'm better than average? So what does that mean, I think I'm better than average? Say that again? My perception. But I win when I think I'm better. My perception means what? I think I'm um, better meaning. So I wanted to write it down very carefully. So now if I'm going to write it down carefully like a theorist, I have to define these terms. Hopefully define them in a way that corresponds to the way people answer the question. Another problem. But nonetheless, so it's my perception. But I can't like, do my math on it. It's my perception. So what am I going to have to write? What would it mean to think or better? Your beliefs, what about your belief? So I have beliefs on whether I'm better or not. And then you say, do you think you're better? And I say, yes. What would you conclude about my belief? So look, at this point, either you're saying, well, that's kind of interesting, or wow, that's really annoying. If you're saying, wow, that's really annoying, you know, it's just like picking, picking, picking to try to get to something very precisely, your initial inclination is not to be a theorist. If you're going, well, that's kind of interesting, you've got to find those terms and like that. Maybe you're more inclined to be a theorist. Maybe you'll say, yeah, but it's kind of in a really boring theorist kind of way. Maybe not. But nonetheless, hopefully by the end we'll all say, oh, yeah, it is important to be a theorist. So let me just try to be more precise. I said, it's my perception. I think I'm better. And I'm going to write down a proof. Most can't think they're better, because only 50% are better. But I can't say, oh, I think they're better. They have a perception that they're better. That's not going to be the trick for me. So if I think better means something about their beliefs, what does it mean about their beliefs? Depends on culture. So it could mean a lot of things. It could mean a lot of things about my beliefs. Well, let's go on. Let's go on. Let's just keep that somewhere in the back of our minds. But again, at this point, what I'm suggesting is, listen, the reason I picked this, other than the fact that I wrote a paper on it, is I've given you about the most straightforward, obvious experiment I can think of. If I just give you this result, if I say 80% of people think they're better than sacred drivers, you can go say that to anybody who doesn't know anything about economics, who has no training in anything at all, and they'll just say, wow, people are overconfident. They're not going to stop and say, well, what does that mean exactly? Can you explain it? As there might be some complicated stuff. Economics, it just seems very, very obvious and straightforward. It seems like there's really nothing to say about it at all. Even if I say, why does it imply that people are overconfident? It sounds like that's just a stupid question I'm asking. It's because only 50%, it's obvious, median mean thing, but we've taken care of that. 
So again, I want to argue, yeah, but you know what? If I'm just thinking ahead to your future work, whatever you write, like the most obvious, simple thing, doesn't hurt to pause and step back and say, okay, well, what exactly does that mean? Now, if I come here at this point and I say, okay, it's their perception, it's their beliefs, what exactly does that mean? And if you're having trouble telling me exactly what that means, then that should also cause you to pause and say, well, maybe there's something wrong, not wrong, but maybe there's something I don't completely understand about the problem here. Because I should be able to give a more definite answer. I should be able to. So at this point, if you're Spencer, and I just come and I start to hammer at you, and say, well, what does that mean? What does that mean? Exactly what's going on? Just define proceed. Just define that, define that, define that. You're not going to just go running out of the room screaming, oh my gosh, my whole paper's falling apart. <laughs> But nonetheless, you should pause and say, maybe I should just think a little bit more deeply because I'm having trouble answering the most basic question about this result. Let's, now, let's go ahead and look more closely. So this is an actual question. 